You're listening to the 95 Podcast from the team at 95 Network, where we host conversations specifically designed to support leaders in small and mid-sized churches. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the 95 Podcast. I'm Dale Sellers, Executive Director at 95 Network. And I'm just so thankful that you continue to uh, check out the podcast week after week. We try our best to find uh, guests that uh, I think speak to the small and the mid-sized church space. Uh, and we try to be very broad in our topics and, and, and folks we, that we talk with. And man, I'm so excited about the guests we have today. Uh, I learned about him from one of our 95 Network team members, Jason Allison, who had said, man, listen, you've got to connect with Derek Sanford. You've got to connect with him. He's, he's awesome. And so um, he, I got a copy of Derek's book. We'll talk about, about that a little bit later. Uh, and then actually had a chance to talk with Derek a few weeks ago. And man, alive, was I impressed. Uh, I just told him, I said, you know, he's, he's, the, biggest, he's the church I recommend to everybody in America. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm so excited to have him. Derek, welcome, man. How are you doing? It's good to have you on the 95 podcast today. Thanks, Dale. It's so great to be here. I'm really, really honored to, to be with you. Now, you're in Erie, Pennsylvania, I believe. Is that correct? Erie, PA. Yeah. Uh, really born and raised, grew up around here. So, you know, we're in this uh, northwest corner of Pennsylvania, right on Lake Erie. We get all the snow. I was going to say, do you guys uh, ever have people, summer? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, we say there's two seasons here, winter and the 4th of July. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'm being a South Carolina boy. I, I love to see it and I love to leave it. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I appreciate, it. I appreciate what you do. What we're going to do is we're going to dive in, get to know you, hear your story a little bit. And then I want to talk about what God's been doing in Erie, Pennsylvania. But first, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. So I'm here with my friend, Derek Sanford. He's going to talk to us today about what God's doing in the church. And I uh, also want to remind everyone that's listening, hey, if you have not had a chance to go to 95, the number's 95, 95network.org, and uh, go through the uh, soul care essentials that we have provided for you, or either the Healthy Church uh, Assessment, take, take some time and go do that. If you're in a place in your ministry right now where you're just like, man, I am I'm just shot. I'm tired. I'm worn out. Well, we have made an adjustment at 95 Network throughout this year to really kind of dive in and help serve pastors who are just, uh, man, they're burned out. They're just kind of at the end of the rope. And so we, we created the Soul Care Essentials. In the next few weeks, I'll be announcing a very exciting thing we're doing. Uh, we're actually creating a new brand new conference, a new half day conference. Uh, called Soul Care Essentials. I just finished that up actually yesterday, uh, getting it ready. So we're going to be rolling that out soon because we care about you. And we say, I've always said this, if um, it takes a healthy pastor to have a healthy church, if you're unhealthy as a leader, you're probably going to have an unhealthy organization. So take a time when you have a chance, maybe after you listen to the podcast today, go to 95network.org. Uh, the uh, surveys are right there on the homepage. Derek, tell us a little bit about your story. You, you're pastoring there in Erie, Pennsylvania, been there your whole life. How did you become uh, uh, the senior pastor and just kind of how did, how did everything evolve for you? Yeah, so I had a, uh, I had a crisis of faith in college uh, and uh, became an atheist for a little while and uh, really explored lots of world religions and tried all kinds of stuff and eventually came back to the truth of the resurrection. And about that time, got the, uh, got the calling to to be a pastor. And so uh, my wife and I moved back to our, our hometown and I actually uh, eventually came back to my home church, which is Grace Church, the church I'm at now. I've been there for almost 28 years uh, at this point. So it's a little weird to be back in the church that, you know, I was, uh, I was in the youth group at, you know, back wow. in the day. Uh, but uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm back at my home church uh, for now almost 30 years, uh, came through all kinds of positions in the church, uh, youth pastor, uh, worship pastor, small group pastor, executive pastor, and uh, I've been the lead pastor here for the last uh, 11 years. And uh, it's been it's been a real joy to see our church. Our church is an old church. Um, 1895, we began as a wow. house church, a Swedish, a Swedish immigrants, a Swedish Baptist church here in downtown Erie. And uh, eventually made the, uh, the 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 jump to the suburbs and all that all that stuff. And uh, there's a really cool story with our original building that we probably don't have time for on this. Oh podcast, no, that's but, oh, you've already uh, you baited us. Now you got to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we recently. 
the, the, the building was built in 1906 down in the urban core of Erie. And um, there's a bit of revitalization going on right now. And in the, in the, so we have a, it's a historic building. We sold it back in the 50s mm -hmm. uh, and it's been art studios and all kind of stuff since then. And we we recently had a big company uh, uh, buy it up. They actually bought up the whole block and contacted us and basically asked us if we wanted our if we wanted our original building back. So we reacquired our original building cool. and uh, we've, we've turned it into uh, what we're calling the Grace Leadership Institute. Um, we're in one of the poorest zip codes in the country and uh, we were bringing Christian leadership uh, training and uh, Christian education uh, to that little section of the world and also using it for lots of churches hopefully to um uh to to raise the level of their volunteer um base and biblical knowledge and theological understanding and that sort of thing so we're very very excited about it i've had an opportunity over the last four years to do a good bit of work in the northeast and it's a tough place what what's eerie like yeah yeah tough as well um you know it's a blue collar town manufacturing town uh, similar to Pittsburgh, like, you know, as people, what, whatever people think of Pittsburgh, uh, Erie is kind of similar and Buffalo, you know, we're kind of in that, in that, um, demographic. So it's blue collar, a lot of manufacturing, highly, uh, Catholic. Uh, so I think the last time I checked, it was like 83% Catholic or something like that in Erie. So, um, uh, you know, an old Catholic town and, uh, uh, you know, but it's got, it's got some, you know, some really cool tendencies, you know, I mean, there's, well, because we're right on the lake, there's some tourism going on and people come to visit the lake. And, and uh, as I said, we've got some revitalization going on in our, in our urban core, which is, which is really great to see. So, but it is, I mean, spiritually, it's a tough place. It's, uh, you know, pretty traditional, pretty stuck. Uh, every, you know, everybody's kind of stuck in their ways. You know, I hear about, you know, uh, churches that exist in Arizona and stuff like that, where everything is new, you know, every strip yeah. mall is new, every, yeah. you know, and so people are used to new and change and all that kind of stuff. Here is just the opposite. In fact, I, I know there was, um, you know, one of the things we talk about is Procter and Gamble and some of these companies, Erie's a research market uh, because it's been said, you know, if a new product can work in Erie, it can work anywhere in the country because really? people are so set in their ways. So, you know, change comes slow. It's hard to, you know, pu push new things through. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really, really a great, you know, I, I just love the summer. So you're never going to get a summer anywhere as beautiful as Erie. I'm convinced. Yeah, well, it's because it's a short. It's got, it's got to get it on yeah. every day. <laughs> that day is I grew up in South Carolina and I grew up in, in a Protestant church. And so I don't know, I, I know a, a, of the Catholic church. I don't know a lot about the Catholic mm -hmm. church, but one of the things I just thought of, and maybe some of our listeners have had this thought too. So, so it's heavily Catholic, but I don't know that it's heavily committed if when I hear you say in there, yeah. well, how, how does that work within just Catholic families? You just, just keep passing it down. Is that, is that kind of the mindset that if you grew, if you were born in Catholic family, you just, you remain Catholic. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's how it works. And I mean, I, it is be, because the, uh, because the theology of the, the Catholic church is basically that, you know, you're saved and, and, you know, come, come to faith as a baby, yeah. Um, as your parents baptize you into the church, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of this thing that, that was thrust upon you before, before yeah. you had a decision. And so there's this kind of obligation that walks through your life with you. One of the things that we find, obviously we, 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 we get a lot of, you know, ex Catholics or non-practicing Catholics or mm -hmm. curious Catholics that come, come to our church. And it's very interesting to hear their stories because one of the biggest obstacles that they have to overcome is, you know, my grandma, my grandma would disown me if yes. she knew I was coming to your church. There's, you know, there's this deep sense that if you go to any other church other than a Catholic church, you know, you're committing this uh, deep sin. And uh, so, you know, it, it does very much. It's almost kind of like, a, um, you know, we, we have a church partner in Japan. It's almost kind of that it, it smacks of that, you know, uh, ancestor mm -hmm. uh, honor you know or something like that where it's sure. like i don't want to do anything to dishonor disrespect my oh i get my it. ancestor uh, we had a, a guy in our church that i pastored years ago and he grew up muslim and he married a christian lady and and, yeah. and it, at one point he actually so we sat and talked and he wanted to come to faith in christ but he said the biggest problem he had was that he would be condemning his family to hell if he did that and so yeah. 
it was a huge, huge struggle for him. And so with that kind of vibe there, how are you guys yeah. perceived in the community as far as, you know, as far as Grace Church goes? How, how do, how do yeah. you fight battles with the community or is it, are you been there long enough now to where you're just kind of part of the fabric? Yeah, for sure. We're, we're part of the fabric, but I, I would say there's still kind of a split, a split view. Um, you know, I think some, you know, just real hardcore uh, Catholics and traditionalists see us as the, you know, the crazy, the crazy new kids on the block that are changing everything and doing things a different way. Um, but I also think because of our years of just really trying to serve the community well, you know, part of that is that we've partnered with, you know, the, the Catholic, the Catholic church for, for all of its baggage, um, has led the way for most of history, to be honest with you yes. in social justice social and serving justice. the poor and, uh, food kitchens and, or soup kitchens and, you know, um, shelters and things like that. And so, you know, we, we have showed up in mass as a church, uh, to Catholic organizations in our community to just come and help. And in that way, I think have, have built a lot of goodwill, um, with, with a portion of the, of the Catholic community. And there, sure. there's still some that see us pretty skeptically. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, for, for many, they, they see us kind of as the real deal and, uh, it's gone a long way and in, in establishing a, a good relationship. In fact, a couple of years ago, I, uh, one of the leading Catholic priests in town and I, uh, actually did a sermon series to get together. Um, I did interviews with him each week, just called Catholics and Protestants. That's pretty funny. And, uh, we just talked about some of the differences, what some of the differences that, and we're very honest about those. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then did uh, what was really the most popular sermon in the series of what we can learn from each other, yes. um, how we approach our faith. And so, you know, I, I feel like we've, we've tried to do a good job in building some bridges there. Now you said you grew up there. So when, did you grow up in the church? Cause I know you said you walked away for a while, but were you in that church or in church growing up? Yeah, I went to youth group, uh, at grace church. So my okay. parents moved here when we were, when we, when I was in high school. So I was a youth kid there and then moved away, uh, had the crisis of faith while I was in college and, uh, then came back to the Lord and, and came back to the church. And I, I am thankful for that time away. Um, it allowed, I think me to do some soul searching, I think it allowed some distance between me and the church that they didn't just see me as that kid that was running around causing mm -hmm. trouble while I was in the in youth ministry. As you, as you had been doing probably. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, <laughs> now you follow, you follow the, the, the pastor who had been there a long time. What was his story? Yeah. Yeah. So Al Detter was my predecessor. He had been uh, at the church for 32 years before me. So he was very much a, a mentor and a friend uh, to me and, uh, really led the, the church through some difficult times through the worship wars of the early, you know, two thousands. And oh, y'all had, know, had trouble with music there. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. So, yeah. We, we, most churches have no trouble with music. It's just, it's yeah, no, music. I know. Yeah. It's very unique. <laughs> it must be just unique to, yeah. Eat. So, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> just grumpy people, but we, we saw the church go from, you know, 600 to 300 and, and, uh, you know, was in a full rebuild after a split, almost lost our entire staff. And, uh, you know, I, I got to see, got a front row seat to see church dysfunction and board dysfunction and all the stuff. And, and, uh, really ultimately, uh, I consider a, a, just a beautiful redemption story. I just see how God has, uh, blessed and, and, uh, and I really believe honored our, uh, honored the faithfulness of his people, uh, at our church and some of our staff that really stuck around through all of that. And, uh, and, and kind of, I mean, to be honest with you, it kind of cleared the decks for, for us to, to take a new approach, um, to church, which is what, what kind of, I wrote the book about. He kind of paid a lot of the dues then. <laughs> he did. He did. And I, you know, I was the executive pastor at the time. And so, you know, a lot of ways we were walking through it together and, and we didn't do it perfectly, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'm so grateful for his, uh, his faithfulness. And we had a, you know, we had a transition, um, where he handed over the reins, uh, of lead pastor to me. And then he stayed on staff himself for a couple of years through that transition. And so we were able to navigate that in a very healthy way. And, it, you know, it was one of those things where he was, he was standing before the church one Sunday, I was standing before the church as the, the lead pastor the next Sunday. And we had a, a very, very smooth uh, succession 
transition, which I'm I'm just so grateful about. I've I've heard lots of horror stories about it's how that can very go. Very unusual. Very unusual yeah. for. And in fact, I I would love to. Is there any anything we can glean from that particular thing that you could share with us? I mean, I know you said it went well. Is there any any uh, insight you can no. give us? Because this is a big. This is probably my biggest question as I've gotten older in ministry. Yeah is I don't understand why we don't hand off things well, while we don't either. A lot of times we don't even have a succession plan, but, but even, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of like we lead to, you know, for 25 years and then it's all of a sudden, Oh, I guess I'm not going to be here forever. And we picked somebody, but we didn't groom them. We didn't prepare them. Did you guys, how did you, how did you approach it as that time was coming? Yeah. Um, the, so I, I give all really all the credit to, to Al Detter. I mean, if it weren't for, it takes a special kind of person to be able to do that. Yeah. You know, you have to have a special kind of humility, a special kind of love for Jesus um, and understanding kind of your place in the scheme of things to be able to hand off something well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I give all the credit to him, but, you know, I'll say a couple of things, you know, he, he, we started talking about this five years before it happened where he actually brought me in on the conversation and he said, I think you're the guy um, I want to, I want to, you know, spend more time with you. I want to bring you in on more decisions. I want to have you, you know, leading more things, preaching more. Like there were some very specific things. That Can I ask you this question? Did you already know yeah. in your heart you wanted to do it? Yeah. Okay. All right. So keep yeah. So I, I knew, I knew that I was called to be a lead pastor at some point. Okay. Um, when he talked to me five years before it happened, I, to be honest, it was great timing because I thought the time was then, like I thought I was ready mm -hmm. right then. I had been on staff at that point for, you know, whatever, 10 or 12 years already, 15 years. And, you know, I was ready to go. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I guess my side of it was, <laughs> yeah, I guess my side of it was, I was, I was willing to wait. I was willing to hang in there for the long haul. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't the, you know, Hey, I need to be a senior pastor now. And I better, it better happen within the year or I'm out of here. Sure. Um, I stuck in for the long haul, but, but he also, um, you know, demonstrated tremendous foresight and humility. And then he just knew when, the, I mean, once it happened, it happened very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we went in, we went away to a retreat, uh, a, a couple day retreat and some of our younger staff were along and we started talking about the future of the church. And, and he walked into that retreat thinking that he had a few years left and he walked out of that retreat saying, Hey, it's time. It's time right now. And like how, literally how left was there. He? Oh boy. He was early sixties, maybe early 61. 60s. Okay, good. So he was reaching what, what we typically 62. call retirement age, but he, I wasn't there. Yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, he walked out of that retreat going, I don't think, I, I think we need to do this now. Like, I think the time has come. So he met with the elders a week later, uh, began the process and really from beginning to end, from when he decided for sure that he was going to hand it off, it was about a three month window. Um, you know, we did some, <laughs> we did some, uh, public meetings and church, you know, church wide Q and A's and all that kind of stuff. But, um, and then that next annual meeting, we were, we had made the transition. So. Had you already, uh, kind of told the church when you first, cause you said it was like a five-year process. Did they know this was eventually going to happen sometime or did, was this mostly inner, inner leadership? It was inner leadership. Okay. All right, yeah. So. He, he, we, he didn't announce to the church until the very, very end. I mean, people could see because I was getting more preaching time and making more decisions. And I was the one standing up announcing big, you know, big new initiatives and that sort of a thing. So it, it, people could see that it was happening and sense that it was happening, but really until three months before it was not put into Official. words to the whole congregation. Okay. Now another a huge question that I think is, is you said he stayed there for two more years. He did. Yeah. That usually doesn't go well. How did it go for you guys? Right. It went great. Um, and again, I attribute a lot of it to, to his humility, but you know, anything that came to him that was, uh, you know, was my thing to deal with. He sent people to me <laughs> and said, Hey, that's a Derek issue. I'm not even going to speak to it. Um, and I think he, he just really leaned in. I mean, we, he, he did more of a care and care and support kind of role, like a pastoral counseling kind of role. Mm -hmm. And uh, he led one of our, one of our sites. Uh, so we have kind of a traditional venue. Mm -hmm. uh, in a kind of a multi-site way. And uh, he led that site and still stayed connected to that congregation, really, that had been with him the longest. The, the people he uh, had pastored were always going to know him as their pastor. He kind of yeah, pastored exactly. them on the way out. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, cool. Exactly.
So that was good. And looking back now, is there anything about that process that you would have done differently? I really don't think so. Good. I mean, I, I mean, honestly, I, I think Woo. it went as smoothly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it went as smoothly. Somebody did as something possible. right. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it was, unique. Listen, it was a... unique to you guys. It was unique to his personality yeah. and your personality. And, and, yeah. but I mean, we just, this, we could do a lot of podcasts on this one because we're just not doing this very well in yeah. the church. And I'm so excited to be able to, to highlight a, a situation that, they actually did it well. That's that's why I was kind of diving into that a little bit, you know, and, yeah. and the fact that you wouldn't change. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say Dale cool. is just, yeah, yeah. I mean, as the exclamation point, I mean, I do, we, we do, uh, you know, we just talked about the, uh, the difficult season that we came through and the church split and all that kind of stuff during sure. the worship wars. And, and in a way that really did pave the way for this to happen because a lot of the a lot of the people that probably would have put up a, a fuss and a fight over something like this were gone, they were gone by then. And, you know, the people that remained were the people that were very, very much bought in and very much, you know, kind of on our side. Um, and and could, we're, we're seeing the beauty of the church at that point, you know. That's and awesome. so, it, yeah, so that, 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 that was definitely a contributing factor. We paid That's our so dues cool, man. I, I didn't know that we were going to be able to dive into this because I think it's very helpful for our listeners. Uh, but that, yeah. uh, thanks for sharing that. And, and uh, one of the questions I just had, is, is he still alive? Sure. Pastor, is he still alive? He is, yeah. He he is. Okay. I didn't know how old he yeah. was, so I wasn't sure. Well, good, man. Yeah, so he's he, still alive. He's, been... he's like a spiritual father to you. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah, he's been amazing. And he's, you know, he's been doing uh, the interim thing. So churches sure. that are in transition, he'll go in for a year or two years and see them through that transition. And Did he go to he's he's just, like either he's Florida not, or Arizona? <laughs> yeah, no, he's staying up around he's this area. Here. Okay, I mean, well, I, I guess you're once from Erie, you're always in Erie. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I want to kind well, of he does Western New York, Eastern Ohio. <laughs> We got, yeah. I want to take a quick break. And when we do, when we come back for, I want to transition because I'm very fascinated in your book and, and specifically the way you guys have been able to lead the church. And so let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Back here with Derek Sanford and just very excited about what God's doing at Grace Church in, uh, in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, and just especially learning about the transition. That was really cool. I want to remind everybody, hey, if, if you're interested in getting some support to help your church, you don't know exactly, uh, maybe you're at a place where you don't know what to do next, check out Vision Day. Uh, it's an opportunity where you could bring in one of our consultants and we'll spend a day with you and your leadership team and help you bring in just some real clarity on your mission and vision and, and how you go about uh, accomplishing uh, maybe one specific action item over the next 12 to 18 months. If you want to know more about that, just go to, to, to the website and then there's a tab at the top that says Vision Day. So Derek, <clears throat> you, uh, you guys do church a little different than most. So kind of, this is where we kind of talk into your book. Uh, your book is called Untapped Church. Uh, what does that title mean? <laughs> yeah, so th this word untapped, uh, I think, describes uh, perfectly the kind of the, the, the problem that I'm that we were trying to solve. And I think the book is trying to solve And uh, the word untapped means available, but not used. Um, and so I think that it describes a lot of churches in our day, people in our, our congregations who may be available, who have a huge capacity to, to serve God with their gifts. Um, but they're not being used for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, so I, I think we, we kind of made a decision back in the day. And it was when I, when I took over as lead pastor, one of the first things that we started to talk about and think about was reimagining the church in a different way. And, and, uh, and, and really, you know, kind of came to this understanding that, and our best resources are people, yes. Um, yes. you know, they, they can do stuff we can't do. They can, they know people we don't know. They can see things that we can't see. And, uh, and they're out there and they're available, <laughs> but they're not being used. And so how could we tap into that untapped resource? And that's, that's what, uh, that's what that, that's what that title means. So what's the main focus of untapped church? Yeah, so it's really, uh, it's really the concept of how to, how, how to take volunteer leaders, uh, in your church and, uh, release them to their full potential. And, you know, the way that that's looked for us, it, it really caused us to reimagine our staffing model. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've basically staffed our church mainly with uh, with unpaid 
volunteers that we just we just unleashed to 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 achieve the highest capacity role right, you know the most listeners the just drove out of the road when you said this so you <laughs> staffed your church with unpaid volunteers what well, dive into that what is, what does that mean you've yeah. staffed your church with unpaid volunteers yeah so you know i i think the you know every church has i think a bigger vision than they have staff to accomplish it mm -hmm. I, I think most most pastors probably find them in that place where they're saying, you know, I think God's called us to more. I think God's called us to do this. And even if it's, you know, again, if, if it's a, if it's a small church, that might be, you know, there, there's one pastor part-time mm -hmm. bivocational yep. and he thinks, man, the next thing he or she thinks that next thing could be, you know, a, a youth ministry. If we only had a youth ministry, um, that would take our church to the next level. And, you know, and, and what, what can happen in those moments is we wring our hands and say, man, we just don't have enough money. I don't have the right people, you know, I don't, I'm not connected to the right, you know, hiring networks or whatever to bring this youth pastor in that's going to solve our, well, our problem. Couldn't pay for him if it did. Yeah. Couldn't yeah. pay, exactly. Our budget doesn't allow for it. And so there's all, all these kind of roadblocks that come into that equation. And, and we, we just set out to say, man, as we look at the, that vision that God has given us that we think is beyond what we have paid staff to do, what if we uh, approach that vision by asking people who are not paid and who don't even need to be paid or want to be paid uh, to help us to chase after that? And so, you know, we, we reached the place um, where, you know, a third of our, a third of our staff was paid two thirds of our staff was unpaid. So when we would have our monthly staff meetings, you know, two thirds of the people in the room were coming from, you know, real jobs <laughs> that, and coming into our staff meeting with big, uh, big assignments and roles on our team uh, to the point where, and, and I just say this just as an example, mm -hmm. to the point where we had an unpaid uh, supervisor uh, supervising three of our paid staff pastors. And so he was, you know, he was an unpaid guy was leading our paid people because that's what he was good at. And we just want, want our volunteers to be able to rise to any level in the organization that they that can. That is so strange. <laughs> it's so foreign. It's so foreign to us. And, and, and one of my first thoughts when you say that is, so how do you, and I don't, I don't know if this is the right, right wording or not, how do you manage volunteers that have that much power. I, I don't want to say control because that's yeah. not the right word, but you, you are the leader. And, and, and I've always been told the heart, you know, the hardest job. And I think in America is pastoring churches because you lead yeah. volunteers and, and you can tell the volunteers, Hey, we're going down this road and they could go, no, we're not. And they don't go, but you know, so usually when you have paid staff, you have their paycheck, if you will, to hold over their head. So how does one, how does Derek and how does the, the leadership structure lead in that setting? Yeah. And, and it's a great question. And I've said the same thing too forever, Dale, that, you know, I think pastoring is so hard because you have to lean into other means of influence mm -hmm. um, other than uh, the, the usual ones, which is a paycheck and say, sure. we're going to lower your pay. If you don't do what we want, we're going to fire you. If we, if you don't do what we want um, and, and you have to tap into other means of influence uh, to lead people. And, and I think that's just generally a good policy, whether they're paid or unpaid. Sure. Um, but I will say this, I, I think the biggest decision that we made to, to answer your question was just to treat them exactly like staff people. So, okay. so we, we literally just included them in, in the entire structure of the church, including vacation requests, including performance reviews, including, you know, all of those that we, you know, and when we thank our staff, we thank them. Uh, when we uh, send, give a gift to our staff, do we give a gift to that? You know, we just treated them. We, we put, we gave them business cards. We gave them a church email address. We listed them, you know, in the bulletin at the time, you know, uh, along with our staff without a little V in parentheses, designating them as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. They're just a staff person. And so I think that, you know, that giving over of authority and recognizing their, their leadership in itself is accountability. Um, you know, and it allowed, it, it allowed us to treat them just like any other staff. And quite frankly, um, in the same way that we could fire a, a, a an underperforming paid person, mm -hmm. we can let go of an underperforming volunteer leader too. And it has just as much kind of consequence to it. You know, it just sounds to me like you did a massive amount and continue to do a massive amount of communication with each person. Is that correct? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's true. And I'll tell you the trick, the trick in the communication thing is, is to know how much is too much. And, and actually one of the complaints that we began to get from some of our volunteer leaders was, Hey, <laughs> less communication, please, <laughs> because my, my work inbox is filling up with all these church emails. And so, gotcha. you know, yes, the, it is true. And I think we probably over communicated for a time and we're learning to kind of balance that out of going, okay, how much communication do they really need to stay in the loop and, and feel part of things? Now you started this, it wasn't something you inherited, correct? This was just an idea you had. This, That's this right. is the best way to do church. All right. So my listeners right now are thinking, I, I want to get to where he is today. <laughs> So get us from the time you had the idea, how did the, how did it get traction? What, you know, maybe some highs and lows you experienced as you implemented this? Uh, Cause this is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I will say, you know, you, you, you write a book about anything and it feels like a quick fix end product. Everybody can do it. And it, it never gives credence to the fact that it is a very long and painful process. Well, I mean, our listeners are, are all pastors, but just as a general rule, I work with small and mid-sized churches mostly, and, yeah. and, and no one would ever verbalize this, but I think we have this in our heart. We're all looking for that silver bullet. <laughs> We're all looking for that yeah. one book yeah. that comes out. Like, you know, when Purpose Driven Church yeah. came out and, 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 yeah. and Purpose Driven Church is a great book. Rick did a great job with it. But you still had to do what he said. <laughs> That's there is right. no silver bullet. So I'm very interested in yeah. how this, when the idea launched the, you know, and how you push back yeah. and forth to get it to, to the level of success it is. Yeah. So 2011 was when, was when the idea launched. And uh, like I said, we had this realization and it was also at a kind of a staff planning retreat, had this realization that our people were our greatest resource. Um, shortly after that, we had the realization that I mentioned before that there was more that there was more vision than we had paid staff to accomplish. And so those kind of two ideas came together almost simultaneously. And, uh, you know, we, we began a, a couple of our key paid volunteers at the, or paid staff at the time, you know, began to say, OK, I think we have some high capacity people out there that are being underutilized what if we paired them with some of these big vision initiatives that we have going and like gave them charge of it and invited them to our staff meetings and that sort of thing so it started out with about seven people uh, that we made you know we, we just made a big ask we, we put a volunteer we put a, a job description together for them we gave them a big assignment and uh, had a big conversation with them uh, and said listen would you come to our staff meetings now on the back end it involved changing our staff meetings from daytime to evening time Absolutely, because we yeah. wanted to accommodate these because they, they work real jobs. Quote right. Quote. They, yeah, they work real jobs. And so, you know, it, 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 it warranted a conversation with our paid staff at the time saying, Hey, we know we don't want to add evenings to your schedule. However, <laughs> we think the payoff of this is going to be so substantial that, that sure. I think it's going to be worth it to you to basically be able to double our staff without, without adding financial burden to our church. Um, so our paid staff to their credit bought into that concept at the time. So we moved our staff meetings to the evening, invited those seven people to be part of our staff. And, and honestly, um, you know, there was a lot of, of little decisions after that and big ones, mm -hmm. but that was the first step where we really, and, and we just preached to our, we preached to our team. We're, we're just going to erase the, the, we're going to erase this barrier between paid and unpaid. We're not going to talk about that. We're not going to, we're going to eliminate words like just a volunteer, mm. you know, from our vocabulary. We're never going to say that about someone. We're going to, and so, you know, there was lots of little things like that. Um, but we moved staff meeting, we created workspaces for them as they could come in. Um, that they would, you know, sign up for a workspace in the office if they wanted to. We gave them church email addresses. We listed them on. So those were some of the, you know, transfer of authority things mm -hmm. that we did. Yes. Um, you know, you asked about things that we would change. You know, one of the things that I look back on that, that we haven't gotten really good at until pretty recently was just being brutally honest with them upfront <laughs> about how much time it would take to do this job and what kind of pressures would come with it and how hard it will be, you know, and I, you know, it, it's just one of those where I feel like, you know, for a while, like you're casting vision to people and you're, sure. you're telling them, you know, you're going to be perfect for this. And I think, you know, we've really learned to say, and here's how many hours it's going to take and here's how hard it's going to be. And here's your sphere of influence. Um, but you all, you get to change the world, you know, and, uh, 
And, and that, I think that's been a helpful thing to be super clear with people up front. And I think probably what drives them is they see the mission of the church. They see your vision. You, you I'm assuming you articulate that all the time. So it's not just a, yeah. them having a, a title or a role. They see the bigger picture. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And, and we, we really do try to connect their, to the, their job, to that big picture as often as we can to say, here, here's what this is accomplishing, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things. And, and yeah, casting that big vision to them. But I'll tell you, you know, the other thing, Dale, that, that was, that's, that's been an interesting learning along the way that I would say, especially to people that maybe are just starting out or just thinking about this is um, to make that, to make that initial ask uh, a big deal. So, and, and again, anybody who's maybe hired a, a, a staff person from out of town or something like that knows you know, that when they come into town and go through the interview process or whatever, you want to roll out the red carpet. Like you want to take them to the nicest restaurant mm -hmm. in town. You want to, you know, give them, you know, the merch from your church or any kind of gift that you have that, that you know, shows them that you're happy. I would say treat that volunteer leader, even if it's one, even if it's a, you know, it's somebody that you want to lead the youth ministry for 15 hours a week. Um, treat it like you're hiring somebody from out of town, take them and their spouse out to a nice restaurant, you know, put a lot of thought into how you're going to ask them to do this role. And uh, I, I really think that makes a big deal. People, people want to see how important it is, by the way, it's not something you're like, Hey, between services today, would you come into my office? I got a quick question to ask you, Here's you know, donut. make it a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want, I, I got to ask you this question. And so I want to, I want to end it on the positive note. What's been the biggest fail, the biggest disaster as you approach this, and then we'll follow that with what's been the biggest win. And I'm assuming you don't have to name people, but you know, <laughs> I mean, we want to be you know, honest. I think, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Cause this, this sounds, you know, too, this I, sounds too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you, I, I kind of alluded to the biggest fail. I mean, I think sometimes you do have to, to let, to let volunteers go. And that, that is very, very difficult. Um, you know, and I'll say this, you know, the, the longevity for one of these roles is not as long as it is for paid staff, which is already short in church work. And so, yes. you know, we've kind of started putting numbers around it going, you know, 18 months is probably a pretty a pretty average run for one of these volunteer leaders. And so we're actually trying to just build in, you know, some, some natural turnover to that process of going, okay, if we've Do got them, tell for them up front, months, there's an end date. We don't, but we we've come to realize that there, that there probably is. Yeah. Know? I always, I, I, one of the things shorter. I teach about creating a healthy volunteer culture is in, especially in a small church is, is you, you can't, the example I always give is, okay. So, you know, most, most, the, 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 the strategy for most volunteers is need. So it's not about vision. It's yeah. not about mission. We need people. So, so yeah. you're up there and you're like, we need someone to serve in the nursery. We need someone to serve in the nursery or we yeah. need someone to lead our. And so after, you know, four months, you know, sister Smith steps up and says, you know, you know, yeah. uh, with all fear and trepidation, I'll do it. And we go, Oh, thank God, sister Smith. And we take her and we put her in the nursery. And then three years later, it's like, Oh my goodness, we're sister Smith. And we go in there and she's in there's skeletons in there, uh, in a rocking chair <laughs> where we left her there because it was like, Oh, thank God. We had someone to, to fill that role and we forgot about them. And so one of the things yeah. that I teach, and, and this is so funny, you'll love this, Derek. Yeah. I was sharing this. I was doing a, a conference at a, 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 a larger uh, African American conference, and I and I was sharing this thing about that you every uh, with every ministry opportunity you need to provide an end date. And I and I used the story about the the nursery work, and the pastor's wife stood up dancing in a little circle. <laughs> she said, Amen, brother, because it's like it's a life sentence. Now, what I do believe is if yeah. you match people with their giftedness uh, with the mission and vision. They're, they're yeah. in it for the long haul, but, but, but just, I just, yeah. I didn't know if maybe you had evolved to doing that to where you add in dates or, or, or your, your thought you on know, that. There are occasions where we do that, but we don't do that with everybody. And mm -hmm. some of it just depends on the role. And if it is more of a long-term role, we'll leave it open-ended just like we would a paid staff person. Again, you know, we're trying to treat them exactly like a paid staff person. So for a paid staff person coming in, we wouldn't say, Hey, you're going to be the, our youth pastor for two years. Yes. And you have an off ramp then. Um, 
Um, so it, it kind of depends on, it kind of depends on the role. And you did say you do review annual, do you do annual reviews with your volunteers? Like, or do you do for, more than that? Or for most of them. Yeah. yeah. So, the, so there, there is a process already in place where, you, yeah. because see the thing about reviews is a review is one, so you can communicate expectations but it's also for them to go hey i'm drowning here or i'm doing great here give me more or whatever and so it just creates communication right exactly yeah so you know i think you talk about the biggest fail i think you know when we've had to you know i mentioned not not communicating clearly up front and having a having one go bust because they didn't know what was expected sure um that that has been very painful um, you know, the times that we've had to do that because you, you think firing a paid staff person is hard, oh my gosh. Um, letting somebody go. Uh, Cause at least a paid staff person, you could say, well, we can't afford it anymore. <laughs> a volunteer, yeah. like you have to, you have to be just brutally honest. We can't afford you anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's hard. So what's, so what's, tell, yeah, me a big, yeah. tell me a big win. Tell me a, something that really happened. It was a great win. You know, I, I man, I, there's, there's just so many, I, I highlight, I, I think six or seven of our uh, of these folks in my book. I do a little bio thing. Mm, awesome. You know, one of them is uh, one of them is Sarah. Um, Sarah, who, who's a stay at home mom, just like she's she's just a an amazing uh, leader. And uh, Sarah is uh, one of our preach uh, on our preaching team. Uh, she also creates all of our U version content. I think she just hit uh, ten thousand followers for one of her plans uh, wow. on U version. And, uh, just, uh, she's just a rock star and diamond in the rough, you know? And so to watch her come alive and when, when, when she was first kind of in a, a volunteer role, you know, she was a little bit, a little bit mousy, a little bit, a mm -hmm. little bit quiet, um, pretty tentative, uh, self-conscious and, and to watch her be, I think it has a lot to do with the authority that we've, we've given her and entrusted her with to watch her grow into this, I, I would say just a world-class leader um, ha has been, you know, one of the, one of the, the most beautiful things of my, my ministry to see her thrive. That's so good, man. So how did Derek overcome the fear that this was going to blow up in his face? Because anytime as a pastor, we, re we release volunteers, there's always this thing in our back of our heart. What if they don't follow through? What if they drop the ball? What if they screw the whole thing up? What if they start their own church? H how did you overcome yeah. that particular thing? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, for me, it's more, you know, I, I, I do, again, in the book, talk about a number of barriers that I think pastors need to get get over you know, and there's power and there's control and there's pride. And, you know, there's a bunch of things that I think we have to work through sure. for me. It's the, for me, it's the control, um, and, and kind of a level of excellence that I want to achieve and yep. recognizing that it may, may not always be that. And I, I may not be able to hold feet, people's feet to the fire. Like I, you know, like I, like I would want to, but it's been, a, for me, overcoming it has been a process of seeing the payoff. Yeah. Of seeing the payoff of, of good enough and good enough and good enough for a little while because it allows the, you know, the atmosphere for somebody to really come into their own and make a difference. And Sarah is just one of many stories, but to sure. see a payoff like that and go, she would have never, at least in our context, she would have never accomplished that if if we hadn't made space for her to do that. And, and so, yeah, it's the, it's the control thing for me and trying to, to, to reach a certain level of excellence. And I, th I just think we have to move from the task of that to the people of that and go, man, but the people that we get to unleash in the process is a way bigger payoff than, you know, having the perfect worship set or something. Well, like I that. just, I've been waiting for the moment to say this all day, but, but I'm so proud of you. Uh, I'm so thankful because you literally are modeling what we were called to do in the beginning. You know, I always tell everybody, Hey, you know, um, there's this book called the Bible, a guy named Jesus who started something called the church. And through his friend, Paul in Ephesians four, he told us how to run it. He said, I'm going to give you these gifts, apostles, prophets, yeah. evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And their job is to equip saints to do the work of the ministry. And we teach this in our conference, you know, and if you look at verses 13, 14, 15, and 16, verse 13 says you'll have maturity. Verse of, of, of 14 says you're going to have um, stability. Verse 15 says you'll have integrity. And then verse 16 says you'll have community. 
And, and, yeah. and this is thrilling for me. I can't, I, I'm trying to be calm. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to actually meet a pastor in the United States of America who has actually become an equipper. This, this is, mm-hmm. this is, if people are looking for the secret sauce, the secret sauce is to do what Jesus said. <laughs> and you're yeah. seeing the That's benefit right. of it and, 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 and your, and your tendency to, to not uh, to, to, to the excellence thing. That's just the residue of the seeker and attractional movements. We're in the residue of that. Yeah. But if you set it aside and yeah. release people. Uh, and so I just got to tell yeah. you, dude, I'm so thrilled to meet you. I, I hope we do a lot of stuff together oh, in the future awesome, because, man. because this, yeah. this is, this is, this is what God's called us to do. Uh, yeah. and so, so, okay. I've got your book here. If you're watching it on YouTube, you can see I'm holding up the untapped church. Um, I'll put a link to how people can get your book in our show notes. Yeah. Uh, but, but I just, as, as, as you're sitting here thinking right now, well, tell pastors that they can do this. Would you, yeah. <laughs> would you just give them some, that, you can do this. Dale, uh, honestly, that, that is what every, every podcast I've been on with this and they'll say, you know, what's the first What's the first thing that a pastor needs to hear? That you just said it. That they need to hear that it's possible. That's exactly <laughs> and I, right. I, I was, I was skeptical going into it. I mean, we had the idea, but it, then it's like, well, but will people actually do this? Like, will they actually say yes to this? I'm here to tell you, we've seen hundreds of people doing it over these last ten years. They will say yes if you. And and again, don't do the cattle call from the front of the stage. Leaders don't no. respond to that take them to dinner, you give them a job description, you, you paint the picture and you say you would be the perfect person to do this. I'm telling you, pastors don't think it. people will say yes, and they will say yes, it is possible. So as a leader, knowing that this is working for you, uh, when you sit and think about the church today and, the, and, and specifically your church, your church today and your church in the future, how has this freed you up to lead? Yeah, it, it's it's free, it's freed me tremendously because it, it it allows me, and this is one of the steps in the pastor's process. It allows me to do the stuff that that I'm best at. It allows me to do the stuff that only I can do to to help the church right now. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think you, you know that that Act Six story where you know the the Grecian widows are being ignored, and mm-hmm. and you know the the apostles are saying, "Hey, listen, uh, we we it's not good for us to wait on tables." Right. You know, and I, I tell pastors all the time, like, try that one in your church. Try, yeah, don't work, try don't stand up well. in front of your church. Say it's not good for me to, to serve the poor, <laughs> you know, and see how that goes. But that's what they said. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason they said it was because they said what we are actually called to do is to, to is the ministry of the word and prayer. And and, you know, I think a lot of pastors would do well to, to assume that model and just go, what has God called me to do that I can contribute and give everything else away? Mm. And it, it is the most freeing, <laughs> I, 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 it's one of those things where I just thank God every day that I get to do what I do because I, I'm working in my best gifts, you know, and I'm not having to do a, a ton of stuff that I stink at. Dude. I'm so thrilled. This, this is just, this has been a, this is a silly way. To, this has been a eureka moment for me. <laughs> I'm just like, thank God that we, I've, I've made a friend, uh, and he's already written the book. Uh, but who is modeling doing church the way Jesus told him to do it. And so I'm thrilled about it. I'm hoping in the future, you and I can connect some more, maybe do some things together to help train pastors on how to do love this. It. I know that's part of what you, where your heart is today. And, you know, because you have so many volunteers, yeah. you're freed up. You can actually do this kind of stuff. <laughs> so I really appreciate you taking the it time to thing. hang with me today and to share. I mean, I could talk to you for hours, but we always like to end the podcast with this, this thought. And so, so you've got hundreds of small and mid-sized church leaders today. Can you, as we close out the podcast, can you share a word of either wisdom or advice or encouragement you would give them if you were sitting with them personally one-on-one today? What would you tell them? I I think the biggest thing right now at this moment of time is uh, because of where we've been over the last three years, I would tell them to to return to your calling. Um, I think pastors have been forced into a lot of arenas uh, where we may or may not want to be. And uh, because of COVID, because of the political nature of our country, and, and I would, I, I just think it was so beneficial to me that I came to the brink just like everybody else over these last few years to just return to my calling, to, to settle it with the Lord one more time, to get away and say, hey, what, what is this thing that, you're, that you've asked me to do? 
and uh, and really put words to it, really put definition to it, and it it it, it gave me breath uh, to 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 be able to to chase down this next chapter of ministry. But I would just say, return to your calling. Um, make make sure that you're crystal clear on that, because I think it's going to save a lot of people from uh, from dropping out when they don't need to drop out. That's so good. The book is called The Untapped Church. We'll have it in the show notes, as I said. Uh, do you mind if I put your email in the show notes as well, in case someone just wants to no, reach out to you? Yeah, I, I yeah just no, think- I'd love it. I'd love it. And, and people can visit my website, too. There's a bunch of resources there. I've got sample sermons there. Uh, I've got a discussion guide there. I've got a team guide. You know, the people, if they want to take take a small team through the book together, it's got questions for each chapter. And what is so the there's website? all kind of stuff over there. What is the website? It's DerekSanford.com. D-E-R-E-K. And again, I'll put that in the show notes. Thank you so much. Jason knew that when I connected with you, it was going to be <laughs> sparks were going to fly. And, and, and I'm, I'm so thankful we connected this together. Well, likewise, Dale. Thank I, you I'm, for your I'm time. admiring you from afar as well, my friend. Thank you, sir. Thanks for listening to the 95 Podcast. We look forward to sharing another episode with you next week. In the meantime, visit our website at 95network.org. The website is loaded with great resources created for small and mid-sized church leaders. Until next time, have a great week.